you try to market it, and that's what happens. <laughs> okay, so we'll uh, we'll have everybody Beautiful mute yourselves. And why don't you go ahead, uh, Pam? Take it away. Okie dokie. Well, historian Dr. Sandra Bonora is a native San Diegan. She's, she's a frequent storyteller and lecturer on the importance of using a multitude of primary sources to gain perspective on historical events. She is at her happiest when she is hunting treasures in archives across the country. Sandy is the author of four published works based on primary sources. First, Light in the Queen's Garden, Ida Mae Pope, Pioneer for Hawaii's Daughters, published in 2017. And this won the 2019 Top Award for Excellence in Nonfiction. Next, Queen Lily Ua Kalani's beloved Kauai Ahaho Seminary, published in 2017. Next, Lydia K. Aholo, Her Story, Recovering the Lost Voice, published in 2013. And lastly, An American Girl in the Hawaiian Islands, Letters of Carrie Prudence Winter, 1890 to 1893, which was published in 2012. She is the author of the new 2020 biography entitled Empire Builder, John D. Spreckles and the Making of San Diego. Sandy, how did I do on those Hawaiian names? Well, the Hawaiians would nail you, but I'm giving you a woo <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I was pretty nervous. <laughs> yeah, those Hawaiian names will get you. Even when, whenever I speak in Hawaii, I, my first disclaimer is, I promise you, I'm going to butcher your names. Please, nobody take it personal, but they okay. do every time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's very good. Well, am I able to share screen? As, uh, has the host disabled the share screen portion of this? Okay, excellent. Un momentito. And we're off. Now, I, don't, I can't see all of you here, but um, how is my sound? Let's go ahead and, you know, um, since you're a bunch of history buffs, keep yourselves muted. And if there's something when I'm going down the, along the presentation and you would like to um, stop and get clarification or you want to add something salient, um, please do so. Or use the chat feature and um, Pam or Clonny or Eric, somebody can retrieve those chats and make sure I don't miss your questions at the end your choice. Okay, let's, let's take it away. This is the cover of my book. It was just released. I am just heard yesterday that, you know, a typical nonfiction book will sell 350 copies to 750 in the first four months. That's a nonfiction. My book already sold 1,500 in the first three months. I don't know, this book is going like gangbusters and the publisher, you know, they're like, wow, so I, I don't know. It's pretty amazing. But here we go. In Coronado, you know, there's no problem identifying Spreckles for those residents. Are anyone here? Does anyone here live in Coronado? Unmute and say, yay. Okay, nobody in Coronado. Okay, we have this John D. Spreckles Park across from the library named in memoriam of him. We have the infamous uh, beach mansion where the hanging of Rebecca Zahau took place. We have the Lambs Players where Spreckles' name is on that. We have the new John D. Spreckles Center where, or was it Karen who saw me give that train speech a couple years ago? Right there. And of course, we have the Glorietta Bay Inn in Coronado, which is the home, the former home of John D. Spreckles and his wife, Lily. So in Coronado, the Spreckles' name is somewhat familiar. However, across the bridge where we are, not so much anymore. We have the Spreckles Theater, and we have the Spreckles Organ Pavilion, and we have this little tiny bust here, which literally is in the bushes outside the Organ Pavilion, and the bust, which identified the placard to the bust, is on the ground where you can't even see it. I literally had to jump over a beehive to get my picture taken with his bust, and I'm allergic to bees. It was no small feat. Here we go. Now I'm going to age myself with this photo, but this is my San Diego. This is what it looked like when I grew up here. This is the John D. Spreckles building. It was San Diego's first um, 
high rise skyscraper until two years when the El Cortez. Okay, unmute yourself. Let's see the first person to tell me what was a special special feature of this hotel. Outside elevator. You got it. Yay for you. And this is it. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you went there for, you know, a lot of proms and stuff. So this is, this is a very personal picture to me. Spreckle's name was very prominent. My grandmother lived downtown right across from Spreckle's Theater. I remember peering through the windows and seeing that marquee. So Spreckle's was a name I was all too familiar with growing up. Now, people ask me, Sandy, how in the world did the Spreckle's get their money? First of all, the Spreckle's family father and mother immigrants from Hanover, Germany. They came over here with Zippo in their pockets. They had, they only five lived out of 13 children. John D was the eldest of four boys. And then there was a sister. They were sugar refiners in San Francisco. The book covers all the backstory to this point. If you're interested in, in the, the immigrant chasing the American dream um, during 1870, 1875, the United States um, created a reciprocity treaty. We wanted Pearl Harbor. We said, hey, you dance with us. We'll give your sugarcane duty-free entry. Well, John and his father was like, well, whoopity-doo. We're already sugar refiners. If we own the sh sugarcane in Hawaii, we can add it to our sugar beets. We will be millionaires real soon. They got on the first ship with his new bride, Lillian, to go over there and purchase as many crops as they could before the other planters on the islands realized that their sugar cane could now come in duty-free, making themselves very rich. And all oh, those languid islanders, they didn't know what hit them. This is our John D. as a young man, exactly how old he was when he went over there. And his father, Klaus Spreckles. And here's some, I found this in some uh, Hawaiian archive, how they, they were both described with these same adjectives. We're not going to have a history lesson here. We don't have time. Um, but remember, the Spreckles family went over there in 1877. Look at 1878. Family bought most of the sugar cane and are you ready for this 40,000 acres of royal Hawaiian lands lands that would never pass outside the royal family line but Klaus Spreckles did and there's many uh many stories surrounding that 1883 um he, all the crops were being sent to San Francisco to be refined they weren't going anywhere else basically 1884 they had a ver veritable sugar empire and 1885 King Kalakaua and his kingdom was in debt to the Spreckles family. So they had loaned him money and there's a lot of, um, of uh, spicy history surrounding that whole deal. Sugar was what was chosen for John and his brothers. Shipping is what he wanted. Hey, dad, why don't we own a shipping company? Why, don't, why, why should we pay somebody to ship the sugar Came from Hawaii to San Francisco. If we own the shipping, we would have a virtual monopoly. And this is exactly what he did at 26 years of old. He created the Oceanic Steamship Company. And that whole story is fabulous how he did that. <clears throat> it became luxury for now for the first time. People can go before, before John D's luxurious steamships. They're over there on rat traps. I mean, whalers, whaling ships, all kinds of things. But these steamships were luxurious for its day. And by 1890, his maritime history was so impressive that the United States contracted with John Spreggles to deliver the mail to Hawaii, Tahiti, New Zealand, and Australia. Pretty impressive for a young man. He became a multimillionaire just on that himself. Now, again, David Kalakaua died in November of 1890. His sister, Queen Lily Okalani, ascended to the throne. Uh, the United States, uh, we overthrew that monarchy real quick, locked her majesty up in her own palace, and um, she was kicked out. The United States moved in. That's a whole long, long story I cover in my other books. John D. Spreckles and his family were firm royalists, which means... They backed 
the monarchy, they were against the United States. There's lots of lots of spicy stuff in the book about them providing weapons and money so that um, the queen could fight the government, United States government. But anyways, when they were kicked out, so were the Spreckles family. They had death threats left on their mansion in Honolulu. They went back to San Francisco, left their holdings in charge of someone else. And they be- and John D. began to make his mark in San Francisco. This is Market Street. This is the call building. This is it pulled out of its context. So you can see it's luxury. The call was a newspaper John D. bought. They owned the newspaper in um, Hawaii. They knew the advantages to owning the, the newspapers. And this is what he did. This is the San Francisco call building. Fun fact, think of the Hotel Del Coronado, wooden, white, feminine looking, Victorian, Queen Anne, built by the Reed Brothers. Reed Brothers also built this. So they had quite a um, variety. This is their mansion in Pacific Heights. Not bad for the son of an immigrant who had no money. The whole family moved up to this uh, Pacific um, Heights. And this is one of uh, two mansions. And then he began to have beautiful little children with his wife, Lillian. And um, in, in doing my book and writing my book, I was so fortunate to get access to every single line of this family for photos, diaries, correspondence, etc. for the book. This is the interior of his mansion. So you can see John D. Spreckles lived quite opulently. He traveled the world. He had lots of antiques. So it was no, um, no wonder he could have so much, so many beautiful antiques in his home. John D. owned a lot of steamships. He could take his family on any luxurious steamship and get to Hawaii lickety split. But his favorite thing to do was to be at the wheel, behind the wheel of his yacht, his steam yacht, the Lurleen. This is his eldest daughter, Grace. This is his youngest daughter, Lillian. I remember one story I read about her. One, such, one trip when John D. was taking his four children for a two-week voyage to Hawaii, he brought a, along a milk cow. A big old cow was put on board so that the children could have fresh milk. Little Lillian, named after Mama, recalls when the ship went over a huge wake at one point in the voyage, that poor cow flipped up overside, went overboard, and to her horror, the sharks attacked the cow. Wasn't her favorite voyage. I'd like you to read his quote, how he discovered San Diego on his lot, the yacht, the same yacht that had the milk cow, by the way. Let's see how he looked at it. So he looked at it as sort of an accident. I'm trying to tend to my voice here. I woke up with a little scratchy throat this morning, guys. Um, so when John D. sailed into San Francisco, Remember the year right now, 1887, San Diego was in the middle of a building boom. Oh my gosh, everybody who was anybody wanted to be in Southern California so they could take advantage of lots from Riverside, Los Angeles, all the way out to Palm Springs and down here. It was a boom of historic measure. And John D. said, well, maybe I need to get in here. And of course, the leading citizens of San Diego, they met him at the dock. Oh, the sugar prince is here. Oh, Mr. Spreckles, welcome to San Diego. We have such an investment opportunity for you here. Please let us show you. And what they showed him was the fact that we had no warehouse or coal wharf. In fact, it was so bad that the train was, was leaving San Diego, making our only connection to Los Angeles. It, it was going to be gone because they were pulling out. We have no coal. And San Diego could, had such a hard time building because we had no deep water with which to bring in all these um, supplies we needed. So John D., look at this, Spreckles and Brothers. This is at the foot of Market Street downtown. This is his wharf and holdings. It made money right from the get-go. Now, there wasn't everybody 
not everybody in San Diego was happy he was building this. His competitors at this time, this is downtown San Diego back in the day. Look at these skinny little wharves here. Um, they were like, oh, who's this upstart in San Francisco trying to horn in on our livelihood down here? They got a legal injunction to stop Spreckles from building this. And Sparkle said, oh, that he is not deterred. He hired two full crews to work. As soon as the first crew was hauled off to jail, the second crew picked up where the first crew had left off. When the second crew was jailed, the first crew bailed out with Sparkle's money, returned to the job until, quote, the opposition was just worn out. And this is the result of that. You just did not say no to Mr. Sparkle's. During that first trip, he already knew Elisha Babcock and Coronado, and he knew Mr. Story, Unmute yourself. Who's the first person? Tell me who this is. Yeah. It is. You get a gold star. Gold hey. star. That's Father Horton. And there he was shown around to this. He says, oh, come and look, Mr. Spreckles, at this island we're developing. And we're going to develop. We're going to build a hotel and a community. At that point, he wasn't asked to invest a dime. They wanted it covered themselves. They needed the money. So they began this auction in 1886, just before John arrived. And this is actually the map of Coronado plotted out by Babcock, Story, and Friends. It was a success at this auction. Lawyer Levi Chase bought the first lot for $1,600. By the time he was eating chicken for lunch, he was offered $3,500 for the very same lot. So you can see the frenzy at the time in San Diego. Man, to live in an island, your own island off California, whoa. When they sold every single lot for $110, they were amazed. They thought, oh, the, the stars were aligned. God's on our side. Because that's exactly the same amount that Babcock and Story um, paid for the island. And the hotel began to be built. Unmute yourself. How long, let's guess, do you think it took them to build the hotel? How long do you think it took the building? Anybody just guess? It was a few months, wasn't it? Isn't that shocking? Yes, Karen, 11 months. I mean, how shocking is that? 11 months. Lots of little details in my book, all the little things that happened in the building of this hotel and, and uh, all the furniture was, you know, and it was in a huge train accident. It all, it all um, burned up and the train guy was killed. It's just, it's, it started out well. But on February 14th, it did open. But this is sort of a facade because behind the scenes, trouble was brewing. It wasn't all finished. The economy was not looking so hot all of a sudden. And what goes up, people, must come down. And so I tell you, that great land boom collapsed in the early months of 1888. All of Southern California. Hotels that had been built, beautiful, luxurious homes everything was being abandoned chopped up for firewood people want to get out everything they bought was worthless including those who bought lots on coronado island this is actually a photo of lots of people trying trying to get out they wanted out of san diego and they were dry they were thirsty this is ridiculous i just want to go to the east where there's lots of water to drink Look at that, 50,000 to 8,000, almost overnight. It was shocking and stunning, especially for those building the Hotel Dell. Let's read John, John D's re remembrances right here. So boom, bust, and despair in San Diego. But they, I tell you what, they were not ready to let their dreams um, go away. So Mr. Babcock asked Mr. Story to lend him $100,000. And why don't you be a partner? Because Hampton Story, he is pretending he's sick and he wants out. Okay. Spreckless had no problem. He liked what he saw. He said this is his time. He didn't need the money, but he wanted to this activity of building up this thing. So he bought 
he gave, lent him a thousand dollars. He bought out the third interest in stories and everybody who wanted to sell out, he bought. And within five years, nobody could realize that he, he owned every single beach company venture in Coronado. And you'll see that was a whole lot of holdings. Babcock never imagined that his new partner would soon own his entire dream. And boy, did he get it from his family in San Francisco. What are you doing down there? Miss Podunk San Diego, son, your business is up here and in Hawaii, shipping and sugar. This is what we do. If you're going to keep building, build up here. He said, absolutely not. This is my time. So he began to get everything. And Mr. Mr. Um, Babcock became the manager of the hotel when he should have been the owner. Now, I tend to think San Diego was a big distraction for him because behind the scenes, his four brothers, oh my gosh, the four brothers and sister and father were all suing each other over the sugar business like you cannot believe. I call that chapter sugar and strife. I'm telling you, Supreme Court cases were decided even today, law students um, study Spreckles versus Spreckles. There were that many lawsuits, slander. He said, the San Diego bug got me. I think it was a big distraction. Well, he could have gotten some bugs here. Welcome to the Stingery, people. Downtown San Diego. This is Fifth Avenue. Today's gas lamp. We have a little look around. See the prostitutes being hauled off to jail here. Yes, quite a lovely place, huh? The moral um, and upright citizens of San Diego, when he, they realized um, that Mr. Spreckles was investing in Coronado, and uh, they begged him to mow this down. How about you buying in here? How about you restoring these wooden things? He said, I want nothing to do with these shanties because he had a vision and it would soon look like this, not like this. He wanted this. But before he had to do this, he had to build an infrastructure. He said, Sandy would never grow and my dreams would never be anything unless I secured water, transportation, especially. He said, so I set the work. First thing he did was get water. There are stories of the day. People drank beer to save their water. We had no water. San Diego was an irrigated desert. Look at the, would you please look at this? The O-Time Fair at Marina Dam. By 1912, his dams and his water company was the municipal water company for San Diego. It's a pretty big deal. Then he decided, look at these poor tired horses. This was our, this was our sophisticated car and driver in the day. Nobody was more happy to see John Spreckles than these poor horses. They just wanted to go eat alfalfa. And he let them loose because he developed this electric railway that had, by the way, America's first pay-as-you-go streetcar. And then once he developed that, look now. We don't have to live around those prostitutions and tenements that Father Horton moved down here to Newtown. Now, with the Spreckles Electric Railway, suburbs could develop, and suburbs did. He knew he bought, he, his family bought the Hawaiian newspaper to control the discourse. They bought the San Francisco paper. John D. actually was in, um, he was a really good writer, not a speaker, but a writer. And he bought the union, San Diego Union, to support his development plans while he was living in San Francisco so he could control the narrative. But when the Evening Tribune started saying, look at this San Francisco millionaire thinks he's something. Well, that's it. He bought it. He bought that, too. And today we have the San Diego Union Tribune. He gave San Diego its first park. Now, Balboa Park used to be called City Park. There was no park for San Diegans to go and enjoy a Sunday afternoon and have a picnic and board it here. You're just building that gorgeous park because you want people to ride your streetcars and you'll make money off the streetcars. Everything he did, he had critics. 
but this was his love. This postcard, by the way, does not do it justice. It overlooked Mission Valley at that time. It was The pictures of this place were amazing. It had Japanese gardens. They had bands that played on the weekend. It was just beautiful. We wouldn't even have our old town, I don't think, today. I think that thing probably would have been mowed down had not John D. Spreckles um, decide that he was going to restore La Casa Estudio. He renamed it Ramona's Marriage Place because it was more romantic. Of course, he had his critics. You're just restoring that house because you want riders on your streetcars that went right here by the Cosmopolitan. Oh my, he couldn't get it. But you know what he did? He restored through Hazelwood Waterman a fabulous female um, architect of her day. She worked for who? Did she, oh, I think it was Irving Gill. She worked for him. He hired a woman, which was very progressive of him in that day. And today we have in Dole Town one of the oldest surviving examples of Spanish architecture because it, Hazel made sure it was authentic. Of course, when you live in cold, foggy, damp San Francisco, who wouldn't want to own a hotel in San Diego? So this became his paradise. All his children and grandchildren uh, were here for all summers, Christmas vacations. There's little Klaus Spreckles and cutie pie. He would sail down here. He would take his private train car or his car. No end to how he could get around, but usually it was by yacht. This is the uh, courtyard of his hotel, Dell. These are his children. This is little tiny Klaus Spreckles. He's the one that um, was able to move into the mansion where that hanging was. So that's, it was his home when he got married. Eldest daughter, Grace. Lillian, now older. Look here. This is the heir apparent. John D. Spreckles Jr., a.k.a. Jack. This was supposed to be the guy who made sure John D. Spreckles' legacy survived. He built Tent City in 1900. He loved Coronado. This place didn't earn him a nickel, but he kept it because he knew everybody in Coronado loved it. All the people in Lakeside, El Cajon, Santee, horrible hot climates with no air conditioning those days, they wanted a place to come on the weekends where they could take a date, meet a, meet a bride. A lot of stories there. People from all over the world came to Tent City. It was just popular, but it was just really, it drained his, his pocketbook, but he got no credit for that. Now, it, when he was 54, he had millions upon millions. But at the beginning of 1906, he made had wealth but he was near death because he had no health. He had a digestive order. Nobody could figure it out. He was a hotshot Republican. And the newspapers began reporting that uh, Spreckles was near death. He's not going to be able to make the convention. His uh, wife, Lillian, sent home, sent, told Grace, she needs to come home from Europe right away. Your father's dying. He was very, very, very frail, less than 100 pounds. He was being force fed. And of course, the book has, uh, he still kept his humor during that time. And then during the, during the myth, the pinnacle, the pinnacle of his horrible um, disease, this happened. Remember the call building? Iconic the moment it was built. There it is. The Reed brothers did a pretty good job. It survived the earthquake, unlike the other buildings. But when the fires swept through San Francisco, whew, off it went. There's actually John's father right there and his brother. They all went um, to their businesses trying to get the safes out. Good man. I'd do that too. Where's my money? Well, they were one of the lucky ones. They became refugees. In the hotel they owned, he was literally carried to his ho to one of his ships so he could get down here and get out of the earthquake. Um, the women folk in his family went with him. Um, and there's some, some stories when, when he arrived and how he looked 
there's a lot of corroborative evidence. Um, actually, when um, he, he left here, he sent his ship back up to San Francisco, loaded down with gifts from benevolent San Diegans. We stocked his ship with oranges and grapefruit and lemons and blankets. We rallied to send to send supplies up to the earthquake victims. San Diego was one of the very first ones to do that because of the ship. And then he opened Tent City for any San Francisco refugee who needed a place to stay for free. Come to Tent City, make it your home. Now the inexplicable happened. Some people say, my gosh, was it the climate? Was it just the mission of having to do something so profound as you know, lose everything in a fire and start anew, but his health returned. So much though that they decided we are never going back to San Francisco, even though they're going to rebuild. And this is the home he built next to the hotel. <clears throat> this is his home, his mansion. Bef Later, he would build a solarium up here. Later, he would wall this in. This would become his music room. He built a tunnel between the hotel and his house. He had many family members that lived there in the hotel. So he'd just go right and through. He'd go get his hair cut. He'd visit his doctor. His business was in the hotel, Dell, and he went to tunnel. And there's today the Glorietta Bay Inn. He began to just give tons of money to Coronado to build up this community. I mean, read, read it here. Anybody want to unmute themselves and tell me what, what this is in Coronado today? Where is this circle? What's this called? Star circle. There's a Lambs players in here. This was Babcock's home. That's now the El Cordova Hotel. <clears throat> this is the library he gave to Coronado in 1906. Still standing today. This, this is still the same but they but they built it around this is now the john d sparkles reading room if you've not been in the coronado library you're missing out <laughs> gore just he widened and paved roads and then there at one time became a nasty campaign you can read about in coronado oh it was the war of the words between uncle john which is what they called him in coronado and the community Boy, they began this nasty campaign, and he just letters to the community through the newspapers to talk to them. Because after all, this was his home. This is Opa, means, means grandpa in German. These are a few of his grandchildren. See these chains? The hooks that hold these chains are still in the ceiling today of the Glorietta Bay Inn. So you can go in, and so right across from the lobby, look up and you'll see it. But there he is with his with some children. The same time he was um, building up Coronado, he was totally building up San Diego. Infrastructure, check off the list. Time for superstructure. And uh, let's, let's look at some of the buildings. This was a D Street. He renamed it Broadway because it just sounds better, doesn't it? For a man who was building up, he owned every single lot on the south side of Broadway, and he began his building. I'm really sad about this. Jacqueline Littlefield died at 96 uh, last year, actually at the end of um, 2019. She kept this thing in his, to historical accuracy. It's for sale now. Her heirs... I think she has two daughters and a son. They put it up for sale. I'm like, why? Anyways, we don't know what's going to happen. The pandemic has stalled a couple of purchases, the real estate agent tells me. But if you've not been in it, look at this. Magnificent. And it, you could walk in today and you can just still feel the same, the same, the same feelings you did when you walked in in 1912. This was his union building on Broadway. Boom, went the wrecking ball. Let's knock it down in 1974 because we don't value buildings like we should. This was San Diego's first concrete and concrete encased, steel encased concrete. Did I say that right? Anyway, because he lived through the earthquake, he's going to make sure all his buildings had steel in it. They would never, 
it was this is was historically San Diego's first building, but we took it down. That was where all his holdings and offices were. Um, and this beautiful building is called the Chicago Style. If you keep going down that way, it would be the Spreckles Theater. Then he built this hotel just another block away. Now this hotel was also, oops, let's, get, let's, get, let's demolish this too, 2006. Now think a minute here. Where's that other hotel on Broadway that kind of looks just like this? Unmute yourself, yell it out. I'm giving star points. What's the hotel that looks like this on Broadway today? Grant. Grant. The U.S. Grant Hotel. Why? Because it was built by the same architect. So Harrison Albright was very, very busy. In fact, he did all those buildings for John D. Spreckles. He did this one for Ulysses S. Grant Jr. and his investors. So this beautiful hotel was built as a luxury hotel uh, to house dignitaries for the Pan Am Exposition and, and beyond. But it's gone. What remains today is this hotel. I'm living proof it does. It's a down and out hotel. John built this as the working man's hotel. People were coming into San Diego to build the train, to build the Balbo Park, to build the pan. They had nowhere to stay. So he built this working man's hotel where they could stay efficient. It is still standing today. It's a historical landmark, but that's never stopped um, our city before from wrecking it. So who knows? Um, here we go. Was he a philanthropist? He would say, hell no. And those were the words he would use, not Sandy Bonura. He hated that term. He believed that the best charity you can give a man is work. I'm not a Santa Claus nor a fool, he said. But check it out. One in 15 San Diegans in his era work for a Spreckle's own company. That is amazing. So if you're at a cocktail party, just think of how many people, hey, who do you work for? I work for the railway company. I work for the railroad company. I work for Coronado. I work for the Union Tribune. He owned everything. I work for the water company. You know, he, that's how he said philanthropy should work, not like Carnegie of his day said. This is just San Diego. Look at some of the things he was boss of. Also remember, I mean, I think this is a stunning statistic. 10% of all property taxes were paid by Boss Spreckles. That's a significant man. Think about that, you guys. This man, how much he did. I'm still looking for his statue in San Diego. Where is it? Because certainly if anyone deserves a statue to our city, it's this man who's been completely disregarded. Anyways, here's, a, here's something. Um, so this is a recent um, biography on Ted Williams. Just came out um, in, the, in our decade here. And this is where we see a little bit of heart and Spreckles where he didn't want to show. Ted Williams, MVP. Ted Williams, I mean, look at that. He collected six batting titles and was inducted into the hall. He lived in North Park in this little house. By the way, this little house is still standing today. His mother was a Salvation Army worker. She beat the drums down Broadway in her day, collecting charity with the Salvation Army band. Ted Williams and his little brother would walk with their heads hung in shame. He hated it. He was embarrassed but he had to walk behind mom as they went down collecting money with his loud music. He remembers the humiliation in this biography of him. John D. Spreckles probably was walking down Broadway wanting to go, hey, what's the deal with that woman and her two boys? When he found out she was destitute, he quietly paid off the mortgage on this house. You don't read about that in that day. You read about it in Ted Williams' biography who says, it really, I wouldn't have even played baseball if it hadn't been for the fact that we could stay in our house across from Ted Wills where he could play. That's still standing. Here's the um, thank you, John Spreckles, for this um, Balbo Park because believe me, you, he put $350,000 into that park for two years. Now, some of you are better in um, conversions than I am. You figure out what that is in today's money. There's no plaque to him anywhere. But he's the one that fronted the money for these beautiful, beautiful buildings. 
that make up Babel Park we have today. There's some great stories. And I loved writing this chapter. Some, it was a fun chapter to write about Babel Park because it was spicy too. Anyways, we know about the Spreckles Oregon Pavilion. Of course, he gave that. That's an addition to building up Babel Park people. Okay. He, he did play the organ himself. His grandchildren have lots of fond memories of him playing at the Glorietta Bay Inn. Um, Gloria Bayan at the Glorietta Bay Mansion at the time. So here's something that uh, some of you may or may not know. They say that the San Diego Zoo started with a roar. That is because two brothers, they were uh, surgeons. They were called the Wegaforth brothers. They were hired by the Pan Am Exposition, John D. Spreckles to be exact. And um, they would be there in case anybody needed any emergency during those two years. Well, they were coming home one evening um, after the exposition. They heard a wane, uh, just a sorrowful roar come from a cage from a lion. It was just horrible. After the exposition was folding, they left those animals in cages. It was just awful. And John D. Spreckles was a huge animal lover, as was Wegaforth. One of the Wegaforth brothers married John D.'s daughter, Lillian. That would be her second marriage. Anyways, they formed the Zoological Society, which formed the zoo because of the fact that those, those animals who were left behind needed a home. And I cover that quite um, deeply in the book. This is one of my, my favorite stories in the book we don't have time for, but he lent this, his, this steamship to take a bunch of animals from San Diego in exchange with Australia. Oh, the things that happened on that ship. Oh, my gosh. I had to write it real quick because I'm an animal lover, and there's not so much I could um, stomach of that chapter, but it's, it's funny and sad at the same time. Anyway, there's, there's literally nothing to him in all of the zoo for what he did to it either. Um, I'm going to give $100 to anybody here on this Zoom who could tell me real quick what their license plate number is. Go. Well, nobody is getting $100 from me. Yeah, one. one? <laughs> if I ask John D. Spruggles, what's your license plate number? It's one. Yeah. In California today, he was one, and his daughters, his daughter and two sons are two, three, and four. Isn't that hysterical? <laughs> number one. He was number one in everything. And he helped build the roads that built up California. He pushed the button. And then mm -hmm. do you remember that his legacy, his 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 um legacy keeper, his son, John D. Spreckles Jr., Jack. Here he is, gorgeous boy. He died in a car accident in 1921. Mm. Broke the hearts of mama and dad. So he died tragically, leaving behind four children. And then Lillian dies. And now we have John D. By 1924, he's all alone. He had his yacht. There's a very famous yacht in maritime history. This whole book's devoted to this. This is the Venetia, a steam yacht. He did the conversion himself. To get it. This is where he could find solace from all the stress of business, from all the stress of pain. This is one of many um, Commodore suits. He loved to be, I mean, he could, he drove battleships. Do you say drive to boats? I'm not sure. What do you do to boats? Do you drive them? I don't know what you say. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he, I don't know. What's the word? I can't think of it. Pilot a boat. Cool boat. Thank you. That's what he did. I know you fly planes and you pilot boats. Okay. Or you so, steer. Yes. Or steer. He did a yeah. battleship when everybody else was drunk on it. And he got that into port. You read about that story. Um, so anyway, there was nothing he could not drive at all. If it had an engine, he could handle it. But the point is, this was his baby. This is what brought him solace. World War II came. That's the same ship. It was conscripted. Oh, by the way, Mr. Spreckles, we'll be needing your yacht for World War I. What? You're taking my baby 
Yep, we are and we did. And look at the torpedoes and machine guns on his baby. That's a whole story. I actually have, that was um, a hard, hard chapter to write because I had to read through government documents to find all the correspondence between the Secretary of Navy, the President of the United States, and John D. Spreckles. I had to paraphrase those war documents. It was hard, but suffice it to say, when it came back beat up, he didn't take it lying down. And they took his ship. Why not take your island? United States said, you know what? North Island looks pretty good. We'll take that too. So they took North Island as a military base. They had been squatting there while he paid the taxes for years anyway, but he was going to develop North Island into be a luxury. And it was Kentner who came to the scene and says, you know, let's pay him. He does so much. Let's just pay him. Anyway, years of litigation. Um, he didn't even care anymore. But um, this is what the Navy, I mean, it, he was a German was in a lot of big anti-German sentiment at the time. And um, I don't know if some of that was confusing as patriotism. I just don't know. And during all of that was happening to him, bless his heart, he was hell-bent on building this impossible railroad. Karen, you talked about that. This would be the first modern line between San Diego and the East. And if you look at the U.S. archives, this is one of the most expensive ever built, $19 million, which is exactly what he left his heirs, by the way. So they weren't so happy about it, his heirs, and they realized, hey, we got another $19 million. Because everybody who loved John D. quit it. Stop building it. It's nothing but trouble. Everything kept collapsing, blowing up. Look how long it took to build this, 1906 to 1919. Oh, my gosh, the stories around this train. It was hijacked. It, uh, it, anything that could happen. And the most amazing thing is John D. went to Mexico and got the Mexican government to let that train dip into Mexico. It was good for pro prohibition because you could open up a bottle of gin and put it away when you came back in the United States. So it had its fans. So here we go. Let's go down. And when that train was finished... Look who drove the train into Union Station. Do you not love this guy? He probably said, scoot over. I'm driving it. I paid $19 million. I'm driving it in. And that's exactly what he did. I love it, love it, love it, love it. You know, when that train was finished, it was obsolete. People, well, it might be a little bit of a harsh word, but people were starting to use cars by then. So what the need for that to go east was not what it was when he built it. And it caused a lot of stress in his life. And boy, he have his enemies, none more than Scripps and his San Diego son. Anything Spreckles did, he would make sure the son would lambast the Tribune. The Tribune would lambast the son. Oh, boy. And uh, Scripps may have detested him, but the voting public believed that Spreckles' prosperity was their prosperity, and they cons dis consistently supported his public expansions, which I think is kind of interesting. That's his take on it. He never wanted it to be a one-man town. He kept begging, quit calling it a one-man town. It's hell for me, the one man. And boy, here's what I learned that was shocking. He was absolutely stage fright. Shy, shy, shy doesn't even begin to describe John D. Spreckles. He could make no public speeches. One time, he went to give his employees, hundreds of them, at the union building downtown, a Christmas speech. And when he went up to the podium... He froze and his son had to finish it. I mean, he just couldn't speak in public. He, he was, everyone else did his speeches for him. But in 1923, as his wife lay dying, by the way, so I think she has something to do with, she, you know, she's, hey, there's a bunch of haters. It's your time, John. Get out there and tell them, tell them what you've never told them in all these decades building up San Diego. And when he says, he says, I'm a man of action rather than words. And so he said when he began that he invited 100 of Sandy's, San Diego's leaders. And he said, gentlemen, the time is now. And from my book, 
Mr. Spreckles walked up to the podium, the only noise he likely heard was the rapid beating of his heart. He unfolded his six-page, single-space type speech, looked over the assembly and then down to the papers, and after a long breath began. Well, I'm not going to read six pages, but this, he justified himself. And when that speech was ended, he looked out at the first time with papers trembling in his hands, tears filled his eyes and dropped down his cheek. His voice came unsteadily, unsteadily as he spoke the only words not written in his manuscript. Gentlemen, I love San Diego. And that was his rationale for what he did. It was just out of pure love for this city. Last picture of John D. His birthday cake. 1925, and then he died the year later. And you can read of what right here? He was eulogized as one of America's few great empire builders, hence the title for my book, Unfinished Business, was this building downtown? This was not, it's still standing today, thank goodness. He didn't get to finish Balbo Park, excuse me, Belmont Park. And I want to thank you so much for inviting me to share a little bit of my research with you. Wonderful topic, oh, Sandy. You. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. That was very nice. Okay, Sandy, where do we get your book? Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends if you can get off Amazon in a heartbeat or you could go get it anywhere. It's in any it's in every bookstore I've seen. In fact, yesterday I went over to Coronado to Bay Books. They wanted me to sign a new box they got in. It's at Warwick's and La Jolla. Um, it I've seen it. I've seen it at um I was in Grossmont Center not too long ago and saw it in Barnes and Noble. We unmuted Barnes and Noble. I'm so lazy anymore. I'm terrible. I just go on Amazon. <laughs> I'll go to Amazon. <laughs> or, I'll I bet terrible? La Playa Books has it. Yeah. Where should I leave the La house? La Playa Books. I bet La Playa Books has it. Oh, La Playa Books. Right here on you know Rose what? Grand. I don't know. Oh, I can't believe they wouldn't. You know, the gal who runs La Playa Books is her brother is quoted in my book, Breaking Up the Spreckles Empire, Ross Porter. Well, Ross Porter a... is watching. <laughs> Where's Ross Porter? He's here. Ross, speak up or forever hold your peace. Where are you? Let's see if I can look at him. Uh, Turn your video oh, on. Ross, where was he? Ross is her cousin. Ross, what is name? Oh, sure. Sounds terrible. Does anybody hear him? I don't. No. No, it's not coming through. Yeah, get a bad connection. Anyway, Ross, get on your sister and tell her to get that book. To get, uh, I don't know if it's at La Playa Books or not. It, it should be. They'll uh, order it for you. Just call them yeah. and they'll have mm -hmm. it ready for you to pick up right in the back. Yeah, that, that's great. And, you know, and I want to give a shout out to Ross because these are the people that are keeping John D. Sprinkle's legacy alive. I, I mean, who yes, else can yes. we look to? The Spreckles oh, yeah. Organ Society. I mean, that's yeah. thank you, thank you, the Spreckles Organ Society and all their members. They're, they're dear and dear to my heart because and to the family's heart. Do we have any questions that I can address? Ross is trying to talk, I think, but. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Hey, Ross, yeah. you're coming across like this. <laughs> Sandy, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, your slides are fantastic. They're well, just, thank you. Do you put those together yourself? Yes, ma'am. It's such a good job. <laughs> well, I'm a storyteller, and it makes it, makes it easy. My, my love in life is telling stories, collecting stories, and then telling them. And I have to do it the way I talk. So I'm sure if you did it, you'd do it the way you talk. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a kind thing to say. Sandy? Yes, ma'am? Why, why was he given so little credit at Balboa Park during the fair? Why is there no bus there or no? Oh, well, in his day, he was given lots of credit. Everybody knew who that man was. Sure. 
Yes, but the, but it's why a, did it leave? Why is it today? It's surprising. You're going to have to read the book. No. It's a pre- I'm I'm not just trying to tease you, but his youngest son was a party boy, and huh? he was a womanizer, well, and he stinker. drained the coffers dry. Oh my gosh! And then John D's brother, the one who got syphilis, <laughs> married the younger woman. He was your. That's where this sugar daddy term came from. His young brother. She hated John D. The minute John D. died, he she began selling his newspapers, his home, everything at garage sale prices. Oh. You can read all that. It's pretty amazing. Because I had to think, what happened so quick? Wow. It happened within weeks. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Read the book. I have a question. This book. Um, your, your backdrop, is that a mural? That's a postcard. Oh, it is a postcard. Okay. Yeah, it's a postcard. I, oh. I came in a couple of minutes late, so I don't know if that was already. Yeah, it has the John D. Spreckles <laughs> building behind it. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> it's beautiful. And it says, vintage is me. Oh, you're not that vintage. <laughs> oh, honey. Oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, I didn't. Uh, did I miss how he died? What was his cause? He of- died of a spinal disease. Oh. It's a, actually a horrific way to die yeah. because um, it, it choked off his airways. Oh, and, you know, he was a boxer. And, and in the book, you'll see all kinds of little things. He had his nose broke, his arm broke. He probably, you know, he probably moved in pain. He was just a, a doer. This guy would jump off, you know, huge, big rocks. And he would just quick with a temper and his fist. And he was just, you know. This this boy, it's no wonder his he hurt his spine, but it was a really a sad way to die by that kind of thing. But he had been nursing this bad back for a lot of years. And how old was he when he died? Seventy. Oh, what was he, anybody? Oh shoot, seventy. I think he was seventy-five. Okay. Don't quote me on that. I have another question, Sandy. Yes. I have another question. It's me again. Go ahead. Hi, me again. You know. Here in, in OB in Point Loma, uh, Charles Collier was our guy, and things were taken away for, from him. H- things that were named for him were renamed for somebody else, which is really disrespectful. Did anything like that happen to Spreckles? <laughs> Everything. I mean, look at the so- look at the John D. Spreckles building that's still still there today. It's it was it was named all sorts of things. And then I'm trying to think there was a Spreckles Boulevard in Cornell that was renamed by Adele. I can't remember, but there's just, you know, his things were just demolished, just demolished. He had lots of warehouses too. Last one was a pier one downtown two years ago was demolished. So not much, everything sad, 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 but the book is renewed interest. I've got, you cannot, you people cannot believe I'm looking on my author's website. I'm being contacted by just random people reading this book. And you guys know who Doug Manchester is? Yeah, Doug sure. Manchester. So yeah. he read my book. He considers himself, I'm saying, honey, I'm sorry, but you're not even in Spreggles League. Not even in his <laughs> league. <laughs> Fenton Company, and they, the, and the builders of San Diego, they've read it. The book is going in that circles around those developers of San oh, yeah. Diego. because Trepty. Yeah, they're, they're reading the book. Also, Der Spiegel. Have you heard of Der Spiegel? Ross had, Ross Porter, but I had never heard of it before. But it's, it's a German, like, weekly, um, it's like Newsweek. They have a million subscribers. They ran a two-page on, on my book. How in Germany do they know about that? I don't know. Uh, well, it's I probably a Der Spiegel. Der Spiegel. Oh, with his they German sprinkles, surprise. Wiener schnitzel. Yeah, Wiener schnitzel. My, da- my daughter's a little bit German. <laughs> just, yeah. just, just because they lived there yes. for a while. But also, you uh, guys in the book, I know you guys are Point Loma, sort of centra. Do you know where the um, Naval Training Center is there? That's where mm-hmm. my father worked. John D. Mm-hmm. gave $100,000 to develop that. Okay. <laughs> What's a hundred thousand dollars today that I that make that millions and millions of dollars FDR? I mean, he wanted to 
support San Diego. He said, everybody curses me until the hat needs to be passed around and someone needs something. Then I'm everybody's boy. And uh, so he's he's responsible for building that NTC as well. Springer Spaniel. Gosh, so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so much. Okay, we're forward to reading. Thank you so much. And if you know y'all reading, you got my email. You can always, if you... You, if you miss it, you can uh, go to my author's website and you can always get me that way. You know, shoot me an email. If you got any thoughts or questions or like, I just read this. What the heck? I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Great. So I'm, I'm happy to address any comment, question at any time. And if I were th- with you in person, I'm a hugger. I'd be hugging all you around. So <laughs> we yeah. all miss that. <laughs> yes, we all miss that. But, you know. We're getting back. I smell normal. <laughs> I smell it's coming. Thank you so much for hosting me. Have a blessed day. What's left of it? Yes. Thank you, Sandy. Well, thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Very, thank very you, Sandy. My really pleasure. enjoyable. Yeah. My. Wonderful. That's cool. very